Good morning, church. I had committed last week that we would study the, the indwelling and the empowering of the Holy Spirit this morning, uh, but we're going to do something a little bit different. I uh, hope everyone is safe and well. This COVID-19 is going to have to get over pretty quick. Uh, Terrence O'Connor is in the audio booth, and his wife, Dr. Pam O'Connor, his sweet wife, is a physician. I'm probably going to need her after this is over. My wife and I I'm going to go out about once a week. We go to a, a restaurant. I'm not going to give you the name of it or drive in. They have car hops. Uh, they were built for drive in, so you can probably figure out who that is. I can tell you exactly what my wife's going to order, and I'm going to order a foot long chili cheese dog with extra onions and a large onion ring. And either one of their flavored drinks or a Sprite. And then I'm going to top that off when we get home with about four Toms. I'm sure after this is over, since I've eaten that week after week after week, I'm going to need an upper GI or something to, to help me with all of my problems. But uh, I wouldn't have it any other way, and I'm going to keep ordering them. And, uh, and listen, don't you go store order them, because then when I order, they'll be out, and then I'll be all sad. Um, I had determined uh, to read through the Old Testament twice this year and through the New Testament uh, four times this year, once a quarter. I've said that to you, not that I should get any glory out of that or you think, should think well of me. As a matter of fact, that's really a short order. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that if you read uh, eight chapters a day, uh, starting in Matthew out of the New Testament, you'll read the New Testament 12 times in one year just eight chapters a day. I have a friend who I went to school with who in 1978 pledged to do that. I talked to him a few years ago, and after all these years, 40 plus years, uh, he has honored that commitment. There's no telling how many times he's been through the New Testament. He can tell you just about where anything's at in the New Testament, and his spiritual tone and his spiritual fiber is different. I can see the difference in him as a result of that commitment to God's Word. Um, but the reason I share that with you is that when I read through the New Testament the first time around in the first quarter of this year, uh, I was in the book of John in January. And uh, there's so much in John chapter 13 through 17, the very last discourse, major discourse that Jesus has with his disciples. He speaks to them again after the, after the resurrection, but this is his ma last major discussion with him. And there's so much uh, commentary and comments and implications about the Holy Spirit in John that I chose, uh, quite fr frankly, not, not to have that in my lessons uh, over this 14-week series. I have plenty of other material. There's a couple of things in there that raises some questions, and I thought, you know what? I just don't need it. I just don't need the aggravation of it. However, uh, now having gone through the New Testament or deep into the New Testament the second time, uh, and having read that again now, I thought, how in the world could you teach the Spirit and not teach something out of John chapter 13 through chapter 17? And so that's where we're going to find ourselves today. And then next week we will discuss, Lord willing, the impact or implications of the Holy Spirit dwelling in me and you. And then we'll move into uh, miraculous gifts and non-miraculous gifts. And then uh, I think we'll probably close out with the difference between the indwelling and the empowering of the Spirit. We'll see how that goes. So this morning, I want us to, uh, as I thought about uh, those chapters in John, chapter 13 through 17, particularly 14, 15, and 16, uh, and how to frame out this discussion, it became crystal clear to me that, uh, and we've already had that discussion about the Spirit being deity. He's equal in, in, in absolute Godhood. Uh, and uh, Godhood, equality does not always equal authority. Uh, Jesus uh, determined he would submit to the Father, and the, Father, uh, the Spirit determined that he would submit to Jesus. And so Jesus has the right, based on authority in John, to assign to the Spirit, even though equal in Godhood, a mission. And that's exactly what he does. As you recall, the disciples are quite concerned uh, as Jesus talks to them that he is going to return to the Father. He's not going to be with them any longer. And there's a lot of distress amongst the disciples uh, as Jesus has that discussion. 
And so in, in, in these chapters in John, Jesus wants to address on behalf of those disciples uh, how this is going to work out for them. Terrence, next slide, please. <clears throat> the key, I believe, in studying the Spirit out of John 13 through 17 is John 17, 17 at the bottom of the screen, where Jesus says uh, to the Holy Spirit, to the Holy Spirit, sanctify them by your truth. And the last part of that verse is, and your word is truth. So one of the missions of the Spirit is to sanctify me and you and to use the word to do that. In, so that's the summation of how the mission is going to end. But there are a number of assignments that he gives uh, to the Holy Spirit. Uh, testifier, predictor, comforter, revelator or guide or teacher, and finally convictor. And we want to look at each one of those missions uh, and, and determine whether or not, in fact, they were fulfilled. Um, I was born in the 50s, so not too far after World War II, and certainly much closer to the Korean War. And uh, perhaps the younger gener male generation is not quite as enamored, perhaps they are, but, you know, uh, a lot of individuals my age, around my age, give or take a few years, are enamored by war movies. I've always been enamored by them, uh, particularly when you see the conflict that took place in World War II and some of the Korean War. And I particularly think about a movie uh, called uh, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, and it was where we had planned a mission uh, to go to Tokyo, to the part of Japan, and to, to bomb certain strategic targets in Tokyo out of retaliation of the strike against Pearl Harbor. Now, of course, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo had some facts in it, but also uh, being a Hollywood movie had a lot of fiction in it. Uh, but in the scenes that play out in that movie, we see the squadron uh, of bombers, B-52s, take off to head off on their mission. And uh, the ones who are left behind are left in the, in the war room or the briefing room or the ante room. And, uh, and over a period of time, as distance uh, happens with those B-52s, communication is lost. There's no more conversation between the war room and, and, and the pilots, the squadron leader who's on that mission. And there's a long period of silence where there are a lot of unknowns about how that mission is, is, is unfolding. And then over some period of time, communication is reestablished. And they hear the squawking of the communication. And what those people in the war room want to hear more than anything in the world are the words, mission accomplished. That's what they want to hear. Now, they may not hear it, but that's their desire, is that mission has been accomplished. And so we want to understand if, in fact, the mission of the Holy Spirit was, in fact, accomplished. And so, and this is a critical, it's a great mission. It's a critical mission. As a matter of fact, our salvation depends on it, for you and I cannot be saved without being sanctified. And we cannot be sanctified without the Word, and the Word cannot come if the Spirit does not, in fact, accomplish His mission. So there's no greater mission than what the Spirit has been given in the book of John. So, as the testifier, next slide please, as the testifier, let's turn to, turn to John chapter 15 and verse 26. That's where you need to be in your Bible this morning, around 15, 16, and 17. And in John chapter 15 and 26, Jesus says, when the advocate comes, when the Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. He will have testimony about me. Now, had Jesus already testified of himself? Why, yes, multiple times, but to no avail. Thus the Spirit and his disciples now will, will provide that testimony to the world after the empty tomb, which happens to be the greatest evidence of all. And you can, you can kind of see Jesus' arguments as you look backwards in the book of John. If you go to John chapter 8, uh, in verses 12 through 13, uh, 12 through 31, actually, a long passage we're not going to read, but it says, When Jesus again spoke to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but they'll have the light of life. 
And the response to that from the Pharisees who challenge him is, here you are, appearing as one of your own witnesses. Yeah, your testimony, Jesus, is just not valid. And so even though Jesus testified of himself while he walked on this earth, they held it not to be uh, uh, representative of the truth. And as that discussion continues to unfold in Acts chapter 8, Jesus says, well, listen, it's not only me who testify, but it's also my Father who testifies. And you and I know the law, right? And at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. And once again, the Pharisees reject the fact that the Father is testifying of Jesus. And then if you go a bit further in uh, John chapter 10, Jesus says, well, look, you won't accept my testimony. You won't accept the testimony of the Father. My works will testify of me. And we're told in John chapter 12 that even though they saw his works, they believed him not. So Jesus says something else is going to have to happen around my testimony, and that's going to come through the Spirit. He will be the one through my disciples who ultimately testify me. And then in Acts chapter 1 and in verse 8, he says that uh, to the disciples, he says to them again after his resurrection, even though he's already said to the Spirit that you will testify along with my disciples, he reiterates in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 that disciples will become testifiers of Jesus. And all you have to do is go to the book of Acts. You start in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 8, two times in 8, Acts chapter 10, in every situation, the disciples are standing up by the power of the Holy Spirit, testifying that Jesus is in fact the Christ. And so we would say, mission accomplished. Next slide, please. The second mission of the Spirit is that as predictor. And that's not right. And I'm going to tell you what is right. It says John chapter 15. So if you're taking notes, don't write that down. 1 through 8. But John chapter 15, 1 through 8. I am the vine and you are the branches. So it's in chapter 16, somewhere around verse 15. Let me see here. Ah, here we are. In chapter 16 and verse 13 is where you need to be. Not John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. I wrote that earlier in the week, put this slide together much earlier in the week. I'm sure I had something on my mind, but after a week, who would know what that could be? But you need to be in John chapter 16 and in verse 13, for Jesus says, uh, speaking again of the Spirit, however, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth. We'll talk about that in a moment. For he will speak not of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he, the Spirit... The Spirit will tell you of things to come. So he is the predictor of things to come. Now, let's take a look at Acts chapter 20, 25 through 31, because it just happens to be one of the things that through the writings of, of, of the book of Acts that the Spirit does in fact predict. And we have seen in our lifetime and generations past that prediction to be fulfilled. So in Acts chapter 20, 25 through 31, he says, Now I know that none, of you, uh, that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole counsel of God. Keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and they'll not spare the flock. I predict that there will be men who will be divisive who will come into the church and try to steal away those very sheep. In 1 Timothy 3.14, he says, even though I come to you through, uh, come to you soon, and even though that Jesus has appeared in the flesh, is vindicated by the Spirit, has been seen of angels, and has believed on the world and taken up to glory, the Spirit clearly says, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits that, are, that teach the things of demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. 
And then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he furthers that discussion by affirming again that there will be a deceiving spirit that comes along that says, the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming. And Paul says, don't be deceived by that spirit. Well, in Jude chapter 4, in that, uh, not chapter 4, in Jude verse 4, only one chapter book, but in Jude 4, 1, 4, I guess we could say, we'll be close to right, uh, Jude says there are certain individuals whose con uh, condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. So the deceivers, they've, they've, they've secretly come in. They've secretly come in. They're ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our sovereign Lord. Now listen, any time that anything that is righteous or true or truth that becomes untruth, when it's perverted to where it is no longer righteousness or truth, then it, then it is promulgated by those who are perverts. We use that word in our society, but we generally assign that to a very uh, group or sect of people. But in Scripture, those who pervert the truth are perverts. The truth, once it's no longer truth, is perverted. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, he says, You've heard from me as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Jesus Christ. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Guard the truth with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Now, the falling way predicted and that we read of in the Scripture was predominantly based on the term Gnosticism, a term that's probably familiar to us. And Gnosis means knowledge. It's based on knowledge. That's not a faith. It's not a faith discussion. It's a knowledge discussion. And a lot of people think, well, Gnosticism is the Roman Catholic Church. Well, that's not exactly true. Gnosticism uh, existed even before the, uh, uh, Jesus was crucified. People thought that they had uh, superior elite knowledge. Eventually, in about the second sector of the Roman Catholic Church, began to embrace a lot of Gnosticism, and a lot of their beliefs, a lot of their catechisms are built on that. But that is not, in fact, the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and just by the way, let me just give you something for free that doesn't have anything to do with the Spirit. But in Acts chapter 20, and in Hebrews 13, 1 Peter 5, and we read of the qualifications of bishops and shepherds and elders uh, in Timothy and Titus. And, and, and we certainly want those men to have those qualifications. And I, and I personally believe that men who have those qualifications didn't get there by accident. They got there with the help of the Spirit. Not just the Word. They got there. The Spirit has been grooming those men all their lives to serve in the role that they now serve in. But the chief role, if you read the Scripture, beyond the qualifications that we like to see in those men, is to protect the flock, to convict the gain slayer. Their, their job is not, now our, our elders here after every service are in the back, to greet the visitors and to be there to answer any questions that anybody might have. And that's a good and proper use of what our elders do. But that is not their chief responsibility to be the visitation team. Their chief responsibility is to protect our soul from those who would come in, slip in among us secretly, and pervert the gospel. That's what they do. And that's their chief role because in, in Hebrews chapter 13, they are the ones who will give an account for Dave Short's soul to be sure they've protected it. Next slide, please. The third mission of the spirit that I see that Jesus assigns to him is that of comforter. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 18 says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you, and listen to the words here, he will give you another advocate, another advocate, another comforter to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it needs, sees him or knows him, but you know him for he lives with you, and he ultimately will be in you. I'll not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And then in chapter 16 and in verse 7, he reminds the disciples, the disciples are still concerned about Jesus leaving and about this, this comfort that they have. And was Jesus a comfort to the disciples while they walked with each other? Well, sure he was. You know, when I was growing up, I had a few dreams when I was a kid. 
And in some of those dreams, there'd be lions and tigers and, and panthers and all kinds of things after me. And I'd wake up and kind of be crying, and my dad would come in the room, and he'd say, don't worry about it. He said, going back to sleep, I'm here. I'm present. Don't worry about it. Now, I would go back to sleep, and I was good because I knew that my dad was there. It doesn't mean the lions and the tigers went away. It just meant that I had somebody there who was going to come comfort me and help me fight those battles. Well, that's exactly the way it was with Jesus' disciples. You know, when Jesus was challenged by the Pharisees and the Sadducees <clears throat> regularly in his earthly walk and the disciples were with him, disciples didn't fear for Jesus always had an answer, right? The Pharisees couldn't even respond to him. Finally, they said, look, we're not going to ask him any more questions. And so the disciples knew that Jesus had it. But now he's leaving them. And so again, as they have uh, this distress in their life about Jesus leaving them, and he's promised them the comfort in, Acts, in uh, John chapter 14, in, verse 16, in chapter 16 and verse 7, he reminds them again, look, it's needful that I, if I don't go, he doesn't come. So it's important that I leave. It's good that I go so that the other comforter who will be with you forever and not live just with you but in you will come. I think any of the scriptures uh, around uh, Acts 2 with Peter preaching, uh, Acts 4, uh, Mark 16 when he sends out disciples into the world, uh, Acts 9, uh, in, any of those scriptures would speak to the fact that the Spirit provides comfort. But I chose 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For it says that my first defense with Paul speaking, at my first defense, and I don't know exactly which defense that is. There's a big debate out there among scholars, and I'm not a scholar. You know, it could have been Acts 23, 24, 25, between the different parties, Festus or Agrippa, or who knows what. But I don't know what his first defense was. And it really doesn't matter to me. But he says, at my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. Everyone deserted me. I, could, I looked around. Nobody was around. May it not be held against them. But the Spirit stood at my side and gave me strength. He stood at my side. He was my, my advocate standing beside me so that uh, through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all of the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. So there the Spirit provides comfort to Paul in distress. <clears throat> he says, I'll not leave you as orphans. And we think about orphans and orphanages as those who do not have fathers, who do not have families. But in the original Greek, while it does include the concept of fatherlessness, it also includes the concept of no teacher and no guide. There's no one there now to mentor you, which a father does. And so Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm not going to leave you without somebody who will teach you and without somebody to guide you. I'm going to give somebody that will still help you along just like I've helped you along. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I think the next mission that, that Jesus has for the Spirit is that is the revelator or the revealer. Um, we are much more uh, familiar with the term that he will guide and teach you into all truth, John chapter 14, 26. It says in 1426, the Spirit was to teach the, the uh, apostles <clears throat> all things. Now, I want you to listen to the logic as we go through this very quickly. He says, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. In John chapter 16, just a few verses over, verses 12 through 15, he says again, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Now, now, could Jesus have, have guided them into all truth? Did he have the power? Did he have the wisdom and the knowledge to guide them into all truth? Well, absolutely. It wasn't that Jesus was short. It was that the disciples were short. They just wasn't ready to hear all that truth until they received the Spirit. But when he comes, the Spirit will guide you into all truth. He will be the revealer, the revelator of all truth. You'll be short nothing. Now, interesting enough, the Spirit will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you as to what has come, what we just referred to. 
He will glorify me. The Spirit will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive that which he will make known to you. Now listen, if, if you're not careful, since we're focused on the Holy Spirit every week, you'll think that my intent is to glorify the Spirit. As you recall in lesson one, I said that the Spirit's goal, mission, was never ever to draw attention to itself. The Spirit's goal has always been and will always be to glorify the Christ. And that's what Jesus says here, that the Spirit will glorify me. Our hope, our confidence, our faith is the work of the cross. The Spirit is given to us to sustain us, to, to sanctify us, to help us, to lead us. But our, our, our foundation is the cross and the forgiveness we experience there. Now, interesting enough, he says, I'm going to send it. He will guide you in all truth and all knowledge. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 13. Paul claims in this writing that he has received that which was promised in John from the Spirit around all truth. He says, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom from among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, it is written, what no, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things that God has revealed to us by his Spirit. That's where we got it from. Where to get his message? We got it from the Spirit. The Spirit searches all things. Even the th He knows the mind of God, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak. Not the words taught to us by human wisdom, but words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spiritual, with Spirit-taught spirit words. And then, interesting enough, in Jude 3, verse 3, Jude confirms by the time of his writing, that they had received the full body of all knowledge and all truth. For he says, dear friends, though I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. Now last week, Ken, in, in, in discussing faith, gave us definition of how faith was used in Scripture. And one of the first things that he mentioned was Jude chapter 3, where he said the faith can be, and in this instance is, an entire body of truth. And that's what Jude says that they need to contend for. Now, and it has been delivered. Everything has been promised has been delivered. That's, Jude, that's Jude's confirmation right here. So what did they receive? Well, they received the faith. Well, what kind of faith? The once for all faith. The once for all delivered faith. The once for all delivered to the saints faith. They delivered everything that they ever needed to know about the faith. And interesting enough, where the apostles used to be the trustees of the faith after the death of Christ, while they were establishing the church and writing the New Testament, who has become the trustee of the faith? Saints have. You and I have become the trustee of the faith. The apostles no more are the trustees of the faith. You and I are the trustees. We are to contend for the faith. And if that faith is to be passed on, be passed on by faithful men of God who are busy about contending for the faith that has been totally and completely delivered. There's no more truth to be delivered. And I would say that to anybody who believes in any further revelation. In 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 3 and 4, just to supplement this point, and then we'll close this out. 
We are told <coughs> um, that every believer has received everything that they ever need as it relates to life and godliness. <clears throat> he says, His divine power, the Holy Spirit, has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who has called us to His own glory and goodness. Though these He has given us as His very great and precious promises that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desire. And so one of the things that tells me is that Jude and that 1 Peter, or 2 Peter, was probably written very close to the same time because they affirmed the same thing, that everything that you and I need, every piece of doctrine, every piece of information, everything that we ever hope to learn about truth has been fully and completely delivered. Now, when I talk to anybody who believes in further revelation, I go to Jude 3 and I go to 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and we just kind of camp there. And, and, and they'll a lot of times say, well, you know, let's talk about some other verses. And I say, well, you answer these first, and then we'll trot out some more verses. And they'll say, well, you know, a Mormon will say, but I know Joseph Smith. And I'll say, well, I know he's a liar. And the reason I know that is because what Scripture says that the truth has been totally, completely revealed. The revelator has done his job, mission accomplished. Next slide, please. And finally, I think that the mission of the Spirit, and boy, we've got to hurry here. I believe the mission of the Spirit is that of the convictor. And this is a continuing work. The Spirit still convicts today. He convicts today. Now, I know that you want to say, and maybe you've been taught, maybe we have traditionally said, well, he only does that through the Word, only through the Word. Well, I'm not of that persuasion, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. And we'll hold that discussion for just a moment. In John chapter 16, and verses 8 through 11, it says, When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong. The King James Version uses the word convict, he, and that is the same thing, right? If you go to court and you prove that you're in the wrong, you're usually convicted, Right? And that's exactly what happens here. He will prove that the world is new international version about sin and righteousness and judgment. He's going he's to prove that the world is wrong about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. Now, that should, in your mind, hopefully, kind of conjure up three names, even though they're not mentioned here, and I'm not suggesting that they should be, but sin from Adam, righteousness from Christ, and judgment for Satan. He says, I'm going to talk about sin righteousness and judgment and then he defines exactly what he wants to say about those three things in the very next verse for he says about sin because people do not believe in me the sin is they don't believe in me the second thing is, is about righteousness because Jesus is going to father and you can see me no longer I'm gonna go back to heaven where righteousness prevails where righteousness dominates where righteousness exists and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned that all wrong, all sin, has now been condemned. It is uh, <clears throat> interesting to me, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when the Holy Spirit fell on the 11 apostles, as the Spirit gave them utterance, the words which they spoke were the words in the Holy Spirit. And it recorded by Peter as he talked about his sermon on that day of Pentecost and he addressed sin of the people, the righteousness of Christ, you crucified the Christ, and of judgment when he tells them, save yourself from this perverse generation. That the very things that are prophesied or that are, are the mission of the Spirit in John are fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. And I would suggest to you an honest reading of Scripture throughout the book of Acts. Almost every sermon that was preached in the book of Acts, every action that was taken with every unbeliever related to sin, righteousness, and judgment. You could even go to where he had conversations with, uh, 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 let me think for a minute, uh, Felix is first, Festus is second in the book of Acts. Felix, where he had a conversation with Felix. Can you? I think that's in Felix, where he reasons with Felix about righteousness, about judgment, and about self-control. The very three things that 
that the Spirit mentions or that Jesus mentions in the book of John, Paul mentions in the book of Acts as before Felix. It is Felix for sure. Now, the Holy Spirit will always convict of sin. There's never a time. Now, he may not convince. Do you recall Agrippa, uh, King Agrippa when he talked to King Agrippa and he explained about sin, righteousness, and judgment? And what, what, was, what was King Agrippa's response? Well, you almost persuade me. You almost persuade me. Now, see, conviction and convincing persuasion is two different things. The Spirit will always has always and will always convict of sin. There'll never be a time that the Spirit will not be able to convict man of sin. Never. Now, he may not always, not everybody will receive that conviction. Not everybody will take an action. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 5 and in verse 32, I believe, um, it is 532 where it says the Holy Spirit of God is only to given to those who obey. And so, so the, the, the conviction element's going to take place. Ken preaches conviction here regularly. He convicts us of our sin. But there are individuals who do nothing about it. And only those who obey, once they're convicted, receive the Holy Spirit. So, next slide, please. What would we say about these four or five areas as it relates to the Holy Spirit in the book of John? Well, I think we would shout, hallelujah, mission accomplished. And that's exactly the way that works, right? You know, I was talking to you about uh, 30 seconds over Tokyo. and went, this quadrant lawyer is coming back in an airplane, and they finally reestablished radio contact. If the, if the it, it, you know, the, 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 the pilot, the squadron leader can shout out, mission accomplished. And boy, everybody in the war room, in the brief room, will start clapping and giving high fives and saying, man, that's great. But what if the pilot simply says something like, we hit every target? Well, somebody in that war room is going to shout, what? Mission accomplished. And what you'll find is that Jesus never, ever shouts, mission accomplished. But from the evidence that we've presented here, we're able to shout, hallelujah, mission accomplished. Well, as a result of that mission being accomplished, next slide, please. The Holy Spirit, remember, we're going to be sanctified through the truth, and thy word is truth, John 17, 17. And so as a result of that and that accomplishment of the mission, the Holy Spirit inspired men to write God's words. Now, we're not going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 13 again. We read that just a minute ago where Paul says, everything that I've received, we've received from the Spirit. Everything that was hidden has been revealed. And we now have the things that I teach are all truth. It's interesting to me, and let me just kind of wrap this up real quick here because I don't want to lose where we need to end today. We have, on occasion, over the decades, taught that it was breathed in ten, that it was breathed into individuals who then penned the words. And we've had this huge discussion. Did they write with their own words or the Spirit to guide every word? Or let's just let's I tell you what, let's just leave some mysteries to God. Would that be okay with you? We really don't know exactly how that worked. And so we don't really need to theorize about how that worked unless you just I think that'd just be a good discussion to have. But the reason that we have taught, breathed in two, is because we use a Latin translation of the word. And those two words, two root words out of Latin, mean to be breathed into. But the Greek word for God's word simply means God breathed. God breathed. And just as an aside, by the way, we, we, we hold these Bibles up and say this is the Scripture, and that's true. But you know, the Scripture didn't come to be the Scripture until the second century. Prior to that, in the Greek language, there was no differentiating word between Scripture and any written word. Any written word from Caesar could have been Scripture. 
as well as anything from Jesus could be Scripture. And it didn't come to have that religious connotation until early in the second century. And so now we call it Scripture because the world has accepted the fact that this has a religious connotation to it. In the original Greek, in, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where it says every word is inspired of God, or breathed by God. Do you know there's not a single verb in that, in that verse? Not a single verb, not one. We've put in a lot of verbs in there, a lot of prepositions. There's not a single one anywhere. And what it literally says is every writing, and I've added here, is God breathed. God breathed. Now, we can say a lot about that. And this clock's moving on me. And so we're not going to say a whole lot more. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 12 in just a moment. Well, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 right now. If, in fact, the Word of God has been delivered according to 1 Corinthians, and if, in fact, it is God-breathed according to Timothy, then we receive warning, and there's a bunch of other verses we can look at. We'll look at verse Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, 1 Peter 1, 10 and 12, to further... Uh, define what we saw in the book of Timothy. But when we get to Hebrews chapter 12, we receive a really interesting warning for he says, see to it, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we, if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised much more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken that has created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. So even though the earth can be shaken, the word cannot be shaken. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, the church that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God, acceptable with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Now listen, I, I don't know about you, and you don't probably know a lot about me, but there's nothing that impels me, that motivates me more to know that God, the words that I read are God's words. God's word, not, not God word, God's word. That he took the time to share his words with me. We have to beg and plead to get people to read God's words. And it has everything to do with everything we need for holiness and life. The Spirit's mission was to be sure that we get sanctified, and we get sanctified by the Word. And He ensured that the Word was delivered so that you and I have opportunity to actually see the mind of God. Now, there's a lot of brethren who just don't have time to read. So they say. But there's nothing more important that we will ever do, and God forgive us. There's a couple of things. Number one, when I approach his word, and, and I'm older now, I'm not telling you I've always been this way. Don't, don't you get confused about me. And I won't get confused about you. We won't practice any level of false holiness, false righteousness here. I have not always felt that way. I have read his word because we've had a reading plan or I have read his word to prepare for some class. There have been many times that I have approached his word and I have not had the reverence and the awe to realize that I was actually reading God's breath, God's words. And it caused me to not have the kind of humility I needed to have. But here's the spirit who was sent to Christ, by Christ, to establish the word, all the word, so that you and I could be sanctified, edified, and walked in holiness. Well, next slide, please. Let's finish up. So let's talk about the usage of the word now that we have established that the word has been once delivered for all times to the saints, that we have all truth and all knowledge that we're ever going to have about Revelation. We've already talked about this. In John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11, he says he's going to convict the world. We read that passage. 
Now listen, <clears throat> you, may, you may differ with me, but differ with me because you've done some study. Please don't differ with me just because of tradition. And if you haven't been taught the traditions I've been taught, and maybe you haven't been, but if you haven't been taught the traditions I've been taught, God bless you. It means somebody else did a whole lot better job than what to deal with me because I was taught that the Spirit came to deliver the Word. The Spirit went back to heaven, and we're on our own with the Word. That's certainly not what the Bible says. And so I've had to work through my biases and my prejudices to get what I think to be the truth here. And so if, if you disagree, then that's fine. I'm going to encourage you to study more, and I'll study some more. But in John chapter 16, verse 8 through 11, he assures us that the Spirit will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And there is just no way that I see, based on that scripture, that you can simply make the Holy Spirit and the Word the same. There's just no way. The Word is the agency of the Spirit. The Spirit is the convictor. I personally believe that the Spirit convicts people of sin. Now, he uses the Word to do that. And you say, well, that makes them the same. No, it doesn't. And we'll look at that in just a moment more. No, it doesn't. But the Spirit convicts, and He uses the Word. It's the agency by which He gets it done. Now, my wife, as you know, uh, and maybe you don't know, but she had a, she had a, 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 a crushed vertebrae, and, 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 and she was in pain for, for months. And by the time we got the MRI done, found the surgeon, so on and so forth, and got it fixed. Uh, and I'm so glad that we got it fixed because I needed some relief. But anyway, I'm just telling you that, that uh, uh, you know, we got it fixed. And the doctor uh, made a small incision right here on her neck. Can't even see it. I mean, it's just invisible. And he used a scalpel to do that with. But let me assure you that when the surgery was over, and as I thanked God about the success of that surgery, I didn't think, I did not thank the manufacturer of that scalpel. I don't even know who made it. I don't, I don't have a clue who made it. But I thanked God for the surgeon and his talents and his ability, right? But I didn't, I didn't thank him. I didn't thank him for the scalpel that allowed that surgery to be done. And you know, when somebody, when somebody converts to Christ, I don't, I don't pray and thank, thank the Word. I thank God that they were convicted to come to Christ. Now, I'm thankful for the Word, but that's not, that's not who I pray to, and that's not what I think. Thank as it relates to that individual becoming converted. I thank God that the Spirit convicted that individual of his sin. Now, he did it through the Word, and no more than the scalpel is the doctor. And the Word is not the Spirit. It is an instrument, a tool that the Spirit uses, not only to convict, but to convert. Point number two. In John 3, 5, it says, Verily, verily, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and spirit. In Titus 3, 4, and 6, he says the same thing. He says, Through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out generously through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, in verses 14 through 18, and this is why I said we get to it in just a minute here, that's where we read, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all, so that you can extinguish all the flaming fires of the evil one. And then it says, Take the help of salvation. And what does it say? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. There Paul makes it clear that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Now, let me ask you a question. Is the sword of any value if there's not someone wielded? If there's not some power behind the sword, does it matter? Doesn't matter, does it? Remember uh, in John uh, something, John uh, 19 or 20, probably 19, maybe 20. I have to look it up now. It's either John 19 or 20. You can read it for yourself. I'm not going to look it up. John 19 or 20. I don't think it's 21. It's not 18. It could be 18 or 19 or 20. You find it for yourself. It's there. I promise you it's in Scripture, and that's what you need to know. But you remember when Jesus was in the garden and Judas Carey came, and, and, uh, and, and he was going to betray him? Do you remember what happened? That Peter, what did he do? He whipped out a sword, right? And he cut off Malchus's ear, one of the guards. Jesus said, put that sword back up. Put it back in the sheath. We're not going to do battle. 
See, that sword on Peter's side was no value to Peter until he pulled it out and used it. He had to be the power behind that sword. And so it is with the Word of God. Behind the Word of God, there is a deity power that dwells in you and in me. And he wields that sword. As a matter of fact, how cleanly can it cut? How fine can it be? How much detail can it hit? Boy, it's precision, isn't it? So the Spirit uses that sword in order to, co to convert. And no one has ever been converted without the Word. That is a true statement. No one's ever been con convicted without the Word. No one has ever been converted without the Word. But no one has ever been convicted without the Spirit, and no one has ever been converted without the Spirit either. And then finally, we see that the Spirit is active <coughs> or uses the Word in sanctification. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 11, he lists all the sins, and he says, What is it, some of you, but you were washed with, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were sanctified by the Spirit of our God, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. Sanctification by the Spirit. Uh, 1770, where we looked at, sanctify them in the truth, thy word is truth. And so the Spirit uses the Word to sanctify us. And just like no one was ever convicted without the Word, no one was ever converted without the Word, no one will ever be sanctified without the Word. But just like no one was convicted without the Spirit, no one was converted without the Spirit, no one will be sanctified without the Spirit. See, the Spirit and the Word work together. That's one of the reasons I said to you that I have adopted the phrase, it's the Spirit and the Word, not through the Word and the Word. The Spirit and the Word work together and to sanctify me, to make me live holy, to cause me to live holy, to desire holiness, and to move toward holiness. So the last slide, and I'm done. I'm about a minute over. Give me a minute. So what does the Spirit, like I said, you may disagree with me, but you're going to have to go study. So what does the Scripture say about the Spirit, and what does the Scripture say about the Word? Well, in John 6, 63, it says the Spirit gives life. In James 1, 18, it says the Word gives life. In John 3, 5 through 8, it says it's active in our new birth. In 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23, it says, it's active, the word, it says the Word is active in our new birth. In Titus 3, 5, it says the Spirit saves. In James 1, 21, it says the Word saves. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 11, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, it says the Spirit sanctifies. In John 17, 17, it says what? It says the Word sanctifies. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19, it says the Word indwells. Don't you know that your body is the temple of God and the Spirit dwells in there? And then in Colossians 3, 16 and 17, it says, Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. And then finally, in Romans 15, 13, it says the Spirit provides power. But in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, it says the Word provides power. So how in the world do we get to a Word-only doctrine without the Holy Spirit? I just don't see a scriptural basis for that. Somehow or another, the Spirit works. Now, you're going to ask me the question, how do you do that? Well, let me ask you a question. How does he do that? We've got five or six men here, bishops, ministers here. How does he do that? Well, I didn't think you knew, because I don't know either. I don't know, I don't know how the Spirit does that. I don't know exactly how forgiveness works. I don't know exactly how imputation of righteousness works. I don't understand all those things because some of those things are mysteries that belong only to God. But just because I can't understand them, I can't comprehend them because God's chosen not to reveal that to me doesn't mean it's not right, doesn't mean it's not true, doesn't mean it's not accurate. We, last slide. I told you I was done, I'm not done. Listen. Spirit's mission was accomplished out of John. The Word's been delivered. The Spirit is at work today. He did not retire. And to anyone who suggests to you that we do not believe in the Holy Spirit, your answer will be, we do believe in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. 
And so any, any Pentecostal fellow who says to you, we well, don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Boy, we believe in all the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, do we believe that the Spirit is active in every way that other people believe the, that the Spirit is active? No, we know that some of the activities of the Spirit has ceased. And we'll discuss that in the weeks ahead. But do we believe in the power of the Spirit? We absolutely believe in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. God bless you. Next week we'll look at exactly how the Spirit